So what we decided is working to make resources in developing countries more fruitful, while our next speaker is trying to get those countries more access to the resources we find in developed nations. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shejuti Saha. So it turns out, Bill Gates and I have a lot in common. We both love maps, data, and dots. Here is our world. <laughs> Red dots show where majority of the children die. Now let's overlay in green the places where the best and the latest technologies exist. Note the gap. 90% of children die where 10% of all resources exist. This is unacceptable and another example of inequality. At our organization, the Child Health Research Foundation in Bangladesh, this is the gap we strive to close. So let me give you two examples of this inequality. Every year, Dhaka Shishu Hospital, the largest pediatric hospital of the country, admits more than 23,000 children. But also every year, more than 6,000 children are refused admission because the 665 beds are always full. Families travel for hours with children suffering from birth asphyxia, meningitis, pneumonia, the most vulnerable who need immediate care. But by the time they arrive, the hospital is at full capacity. If we prevent any disease, we keep a bed empty. And if we keep a bed empty, we can provide care to a child with a disease we could not prevent. And the faster we can treat a child and make them healthier, the quicker we can make that bed available for the next child. This brings me to the second example of this inequality gap. How do you prevent diseases or treat them effectively when you don't know what is causing them? Let's consider meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the brain usually caused by a bacterium or a virus. It often leads to death, but even more often, it leads to lifelong disability. And in a country like ours, a disabled child translates to a disabled family, a disabled community. If you know which microbe caused the meningitis, you can develop a diagnostic tool, and often you can treat it or figure out how to prevent it in the future. But in the 2,000 meningitis cases that seek care at our hospital every year, we are unable to determine the cause in more than 50%. This means we are paralyzed, unable to diagnose, unable to treat. And I'm not speaking in the abstract. Just in the summer of 2017, we encountered a surge in the number of mystery meningitis cases. The samples we took baffled every diagnostic we had access to. And I became quickly frustrated because I knew if I had been in Canada, where I studied, we could have used the advanced techniques common in rich countries. One such tool or technique is called metagenomics. So metagenomics unbiasedly sequences all of the DNA or RNA present in the cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF that is present in our spinal cord attached to our brain. All organisms in this world contain DNA or RNA. By analyzing that sequence data intelligently, we can pinpoint the pathogen. The CSF of a child with meningitis will contain that bacterium or the virus at the root of that infection. But we lacked a machine sophisticated enough to sequence the samples. And even if we did have the machine, the manual analysis would cost thousands of dollars, which we did not have. 90% of the resources to treat diseases like meningitis exist in rich countries where meningitis is rare. Meanwhile, places like Bangladesh have the most kids suffering and dying from these diseases and the least resources to diagnose and take care of them. This is our reality. Supportive collaborators like Joseph Derisi and Farhad Imam made it possible for me to use a machine in San Francisco and analyze the data. 
So I took 25 samples from Bangladesh and went to the United States, well, came to the United States and sequenced them thoroughly. What I learned defied our common medical wisdom. That spike in mystery meningitis cases that we saw in the summer of 2017 was caused by chikungunya virus, a virus spread by mosquitoes. This made sense. We had recently had a chikungunya fever outbreak. Now that we knew that metagenomics could indeed unravel mystery meningitis cases of Bangladesh, we began the work of transferring the entire pipeline from San Francisco to Bangladesh. That's me in July 2018 in San Francisco, sequencing a CSF sample. That's me again just seven months later in Dhaka. <laughs> In Dhaka, sequencing another one using our own machine. The move was not easy. As you can see, I lost most of my hair in the process. <laughs> but when we set up the metagenomics shrine in our lab and a core metagenomics team, I knew it was worth it. With the clues that metagenomics provided us, we were able to design a low-cost diagnostic in Bangladesh to test 500 more samples of meningitis. What we found was that the mystery meningitis cases had actually followed the curve of the fever cases that I had just talked about. Along with the chikungunya fever outbreak, we had a chikungunya meningitis outbreak that no one had noticed. Unfortunately, chikungunya does not have a treatment yet, but it is preventable by mosquito control and vaccines are on the way. And really, metagenomics can help us with a lot more than just meningitis. Actually, we are using it right now to get to the bottom of a dengue outbreak, trying to determine what are the exact types of dengue viruses circulating in the country. The information and the data that we are gathering from such techniques better equip us to guide evidence-based policy decisions for treatment or, or introduction of existing vaccines or even help guide the design of future vaccines. When we prevent one case of meningitis, we free up a bed to care for another child. In our whatever small way, we try to take some weight off our struggling health systems. Both my parents are microbiologists. They say, microbiology is in my genes. <laughs> Both my parents are also very patient. Patience is not in my genes. <laughs> my father started work 40 years ago to prove to the world that Bangladeshi children were dying from Haemophilus influenzae type B or hip meningitis. 19 years after the hip vaccine was introduced in the US, my father helped bring it to our country, where it now prevents the deaths of 3,100 infants every year. <laughs> but my father had to work patiently for years before this could happen. I am way too impatient to wait for years. I want to build a landscape of all circulating pathogens and help the global and local community prevent diseases in real time. In 1971, Bangladesh struggled to feed 70 million people. Today, we are almost 170 million. We feed every Bangladeshi and export the remaining food. So we can do this, we can do metagenomics or whatever else. But we need your help. I urge all of you, all the goalkeepers in the audience to join me, to help me, help us reduce that gap in access to resources that I have been talking about. Our children should not suffer for one extra day because of lack of technology that already exists, be it metagenomics or something else. Sometimes more important than a brand new innovation is its utilization where it is needed the most. Let's change the map of the world so it looks like this. All
Isn't it really beautiful? We had that map from Bill, and we saw these green dots sprinkling right across it. Um, it was amazing. Uh, but I'm curious about another thing over here, because you mentioned a lot about your work over in uh, meningitis, and how is getting to the bottom of the dengue epidemic compared to that? Is it similar or is it very different? Um, so similar and different, great question. So similar in the ways that in both cases of metagenomics, we are sequencing every bit of RNA that are in the samples. But the samples are different. In meningitis, um, the samples are CSF sample from the spinal cord, whereas in dengue, we are using blood samples. But more importantly, when we were working on meningitis, we are working on mystery meningitis, where we have no idea what pathogen was causing it, what bacterium, virus, fungus, whatever. But in case of dengue, we knew it was dengue fever. What we wanted to understand is which type of virus exactly, because it's hard and resource intensive to grow viruses in our setting. So, you know, metagenomics gives us this way of getting a glimpse of the genome and really pinpointing which dengue virus it is and guide evidence-based policy decisions, let's say vaccine introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sanjuti Saha.